Amazon is one of the most efficient planned economies on Earth that would put the Soviet Union to shame. And located within this state-of-the-art organization are the keys for creating a socialist planned economy to supplant the capitalist one. One of the biggest problems in a planned economy, the need for anticipating demand for consumer goods, has kind of been solved by Amazon. With this technology, they're not only able to figure out what the demand is for any given product at any given time, but they seem to have this almost psychic ability to predict demand in ways way better than the market could provide. And they've solved many problems that consumer goods create in the planned economy with the use of big data and key developments in everyone's favorite subject, logistics. So if that's your bag, let's just get started, shall we? This sort of thing is my bag. Baby. Hi, I'm a fat lard Zionist who hates white people, and this is Tristan Won't Shut Up. In a previous video on this channel, and I talk about this one a lot because it's my most popular video by a pretty wide margin, I talked about planned economies and specifically the wonders that came with Walmart. And in the video, I went a little bit into Amazon about how Amazon had these sort of almost psychic abilities to uh, predict what people want before they even know they want it. And then I just kind of stop there. When like, if you really want to look at the innovations that really are the new means of production that socialists need to be seizing, we need to be looking at organizations like Amazon, which took Walmart's model and made it even better. It doesn't mean a carbon copy of Amazon, but make it socialist. What this means is there are tools located within Amazon's innovations to make the giant conglomerate system it has for funneling money into Jeff Bezos's wide gob. But there are technologies that we can use in a planned economy that this would help quite a bit with. Amazon started as a bookstore, as some of you might remember, and it sort of evolved into an everything store to the point where 50% of online retail in the United States is now made up by a single company. They're not just winning at the game of capitalism, they're just becoming the economy at a pretty rapid rate. And if nothing really checks its growth, I could see a future where Amazon might just be the company. <laughs> What Amazon did, and what makes it special, is that it took the internet revolution and realized that it could be used to sell consumer goods without an expensive brick and mortar store. You could sell goods directly from producer to consumer with no middlemen in between, except for them. So in some ways it's an online store, and in some ways it's sort of the next phase. It's almost a post store. And in the years since it came on the stage and became this dominant super company, it has developed ways to distribute consumer goods from producers to consumers around the globe in an extremely fast and efficient manner. Which is really interesting because in the old Soviet style command economies, one of the biggest issues was consumer goods, predicting demand, trying to get variety of products. One of the ways that Amazon does this is that it collects an obscene amount of data about its customers. A brick and mortar store might know what you purchase, maybe a little bit about your demographics. Amazon knows how long you looked at a product, what products you also looked at but didn't purchase, what products you put into your cart, but then put back onto the shelf. And on top of that, it also lets you maintain a list of all of the things you wish you had. And with that, they can solve one of the first problems of logistics, trying to figure out how much of each different type of product that they need to purchase in order to keep their supplies at just the right level. And with this stuff, they're able to find information about demand that free market fundamentalists of yesteryear, like Hayek, for example, thought were really only possible through the price signals given through the market. However, the technology that Amazon uses to predict what people's desires are, are not market driven, and so shows that Hayek was wrong, or at least he was limited by the scope of what he knew at the time. He was wrong at the time too though, so it doesn't really matter. And this technology for predicting demand has had immense success. So Tristan, you're thinking, what is this technology? You're just saying this technology is good, this technology is great, let's steal it. But what is it? Stop floundering and give us the facts, Tristan. So one of the things that Amazon is able to do is that because of its mass collection of data, it can 
figure out the kinds of products that are related to each other without having to resort to demographics. A store with less technology tends to try and use different types of heuristics to understand different markets and try to cater to them, oftentimes taking socially ascribed categories and saying, hey, you are this kind of a person, so therefore you're most likely to like these things. The problem is that you start marketing to them and then there's a sort of Ouroboros of creating these marketable categories that then they can keep pushing more and more stuff to, even if it doesn't really sate anybody's desires and everyone feels like they fit sort of slightly out of weird categories. And of course, these demographic categories and the way we market them creates a sort of negative feedback cycle, making things like sexism and racism and homophobia even worse and is one of the many reasons why capitalism is detrimental to the human condition. In order to make us more marketable, it increases the divisions between different peoples. Anyways, Amazon doesn't look for similarities between peoples. It found that what's much more efficient is finding similarities between products. So what a store might have to do is figure out what items are purchased together in order to figure out the layout of their store. Amazon doesn't need to do that, there is no store, and all of the items can be beside every other item that has a correlation of people buying things together, and then using the recommendation system can give you pretty strong recommendations on what kinds of things you're gonna want to purchase if you're purchasing said item. One example might be if you bought a book on bicycle repair, that a set of Allen keys that are bicycle friendly might show up in your recommendations. This Allen key set might not be marketed as a bike repair set, but because people are buying it and people are buying this book, they're able to kind of build a bond between them. And through these interactions, you end up with this very complex web as a way to catalog all of the items in Amazon's inventory. And with this data, they're actually able to make some pretty interesting predictions. On top of that, this web reacts to new data pretty well. And so with it, they're almost able to predict predict what people are going to want before they even know they want it. So that should already be impressive. You know, it's a very impressive website, but because it's a website, we don't quite appreciate just how huge Amazon actually is. It is one of the largest companies on earth and its logistics system is one of the largest on the planet, if not the largest on the planet. To the point where if you were to just look at Amazon as an organization, it is one of the largest planned economies ever to exist. And because Amazon's so big, the kinds of problems that it runs into are more akin to the problems that come up in planned economies rather than issues that come up in regular companies. Because you know, logistics is one thing when you have a thousand products and a few thousand customers. It's completely different when you have millions of products and millions of customers. The data alone they collect is so large, they have to go into new areas of data analysis called big data, which has its name because you're dealing with data sets so large that even supercomputers have problems trying to crunch it in an amount of time that you know is conducive with finishing it before the heat death of the universe. These problems are so intense that Amazon has hired tons of talent to develop new information technology and advance our fields of data analytics just so that they can solve some of their logistics problems. And so, just like in the Walmart video, we're going to be delving into logistics, which is essentially the science of getting something from point A to point B in the most efficient fashion possible. That might sound like a simple solution, but it is extremely complex and with Amazon, even more levels of magnitude complex than in your normal store. If you think about it, this is everything from the location and organizational structure of warehouses to the optimal delivery driving routes for delivery drivers. Logistics even means having to deal with things like random stuff like weather. So what are some cool logistics things that Amazon does? Well, one of the things that is quite interesting is that their warehouses are generally not organized at all. They have something called chaotic storage, which is that every item that goes into an Amazon warehouse has a little barcode attached to it so that 
the computer that runs the warehouse knows the location of every single item in the warehouse. I'm gonna say warehouse a lot, sorry. It's sort of a metaphor for the market. If you were to look at it and not do any investigation, it just looks like a big wall of chaos that somehow just works through magic. That magic being the free market. But if you do a little bit of analysis, you'll know that everything that looks chaotic is actually very well organized and planned and works uh, to a very meticulous degree. The kind of problems that are used to figure out how to get something from point A to point B the most efficiently are called optimization problems. And if you know anything about IT or computer science, you're already going to be going, ooh, oh boy, an optimization problem. Because these problems can get out of hand very quickly. If you think about it from the point of view of a computer, getting something from point A to point B, where there are multiple different paths, trying to calculate the most efficient path can get quite huge if you just have even a few things that can be tweaked. And when it comes to Amazon, when you're looking at, say, a product coming from a producer to a warehouse to another warehouse to a truck to somebody's actual house, you can imagine that there are a lot of things that can happen between those two points. And then you factor in all of the other orders and trying to get them all optimally delivered with the limited resources that you have available. And you all of a sudden realize that you have a problem which in computer science parlance is called intractable. What this means is that the amount of computer time, i.e. the amount of calculations and the speed in which the computer can actually process these problems gets so large that it's virtually impossible to solve 100%. As I mentioned earlier in this video, some of these problems would take so long to solve that it would require the entire lifetime of the universe and then some to figure out. So when it comes to these optimization problems, Amazon's got a real pickle on its hands. How do you solve unsolvable problems? And so a lot of what Amazon's big breakthroughs have come through is trying to take these optimization problems and look at them in other ways or simplify them in order to get an approximation of something that will work. One of the ways to solve an optimization problem is to give up on being 100% certain that this is the best route. Sometimes 100% takes the lifetime of the universe, but 80% only takes a few seconds. And the better you can be at simplifying and trying to find more solvable ways to handle different optimization problems, the more efficient the system will get. So in many ways, Amazon's success hinges on them being the masters of good enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I'm a little lost, but fair enough. And their good enough is still way more efficient than if they had left everything up to the free market. This involves breaking each step of the plan into smaller pieces, trying to simplify them, and just make everything a much more abstract process rather than trying to you know, optimize every single individual thing. Another thing that they do uh, to maintain the system to keep things flowing well is something called load balancing. Now, anybody who works in IT will know that load balancing is something that computers do. Basically, it's a way that computers multitask because a CPU can really only process you know, one number at a time. And in order to keep your programs from crashing if you have another program open, it sort of tries to switch really quickly between different programs uh, so fast that you can't perceive it, but in order to keep everything alive and going. And Amazon not only does that for its computer systems, but also does it for its physical systems. Like they decide where they're going to build airports and their warehouses and their distribution centers, all with the idea of making sure that no one part of any of the system gets overloaded if there's some sort of uh, burst in demand or something like that. And so they've designed their entire uh, distribution infrastructure with an idea uh, that was developed to not overload CPUs and crash programs. See, like they're thinking on a completely different level than a lot of stores are today. You know, if I order a Tickle Me Elmo, they have to figure out whether it's gonna come through, you know, warehouse one, warehouse two, airport A, airport B, what flight it's gonna be on, when it's going to arrive, what truck it's gonna be on, and when that truck is going to leave. They might have to decide whether they want to take one trip to deliver this one package, 
or if it's worth holding out over the possibility that sometime in the next six hours, your neighbor is gonna buy a toothbrush or something like that. And you could get two packages with just one delivery. And then what if there's a snowstorm and the truck is slower than usual at delivering things? All of these things in one capacity or another are abstracted and simulated and there's an attempt to optimize them through the Amazon brain hive machine that I can't really talk much more about because it's all proprietary and secret because capitalism is about hurting innovation and development because you can't share any of your breakthroughs. What we do know is that between point A and point B, they have found hundreds of millions of variables and trying to solve those has been a Herculean task. But despite that, despite that complex of a problem, they've been able to develop a decent enough solution that you can order something and have it arrive later that day with a reasonable amount of expectation unless you live in a very rural area. And so Amazon is really a ton of good enough solutions on top of good enough solutions on top of good enough solutions that it's been described as managed chaos. And Amazon still opts for using this over price signals as its way to optimize how to get things and move things around. Because you know, the market is much less efficient at it. The other thing too is it turns the problem into a software problem. And if there's another thing that you'll know if you're ever in the business of trying to solve things, if you can make something a software problem rather than a hardware problem, there is a much higher chance that you're gonna find a solution in a short amount of time because we are developing and advancing software at a way faster rate than we're advancing hardware. But also, as computing power gets better and better, it's going to become even more efficient at getting even better attempts to optimize all these different problems. So Amazon setting itself up for a future in which it's gonna get even better at optimizing all these different routes. But of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it's not a thing that we just want to rip up of its roots and transplant and say, all right, we've solved the economy. I joke sometimes with my friends that if we wanted to have a planned economy tomorrow, all we'd have to do is nationalize Amazon, but that's not necessarily a thing that we're gonna to want to. I think the number one thing that people would point to is that Amazon's warehouses are notably places of horror for anybody who works there. Amazon workers have these devices that are given to them and they are put on an absolutely brutal treadmill of work as they go and run and grab all those different objects and get them into the boxes and get them shipped out at a fast enough rate. Humans in these warehouses are treated as mere appendages of the big Amazon machine. And the work environment is known as fast, cruelly fast, and just brutal to its workers. For example, they for a long time did not buy air conditioners for these warehouses. And on days where it was so hot that they knew people were gonna have heat strokes and pass out, instead of opting to you know, improve worker conditions in any meaningful way, they had ambulances on pre-standby waiting by these warehouses so that if somebody passed out, they would just be taken to the ambulance and carted away. This made pretty big headlines when it was exposed and they've since changed their policy a little bit, but Still, it does show how this extremely optimized system doesn't optimize for the welfare of its workers. On top of that, they're timed for every single thing that they have to collect, and these targets are to some considered impossible. Another thing is that Amazon employees are timed for every single thing that they have to go and grab from the shelves, and they have a quota that they have to hit, and these quotas seem to be approaching impossible to actually manage. Another thing is that Amazon hires a mix of permanent and temporary workers. Permanent workers don't get paid all that much more than the temporary workers, but it is still more, and they do have some degree of job security, and so temporary workers are often, uh, you know, tempted with the possibility of becoming permanent workers if they can just hit these numbers, hit these impossible quotas and get through, which pushes them to push themselves beyond what a human being should be willing to do in order to, you know, appease their bosses. On the other end, permanent employees are fired quite constantly and the threat of being uh, terminated is 
pretty high on the list of things they use in order to motivate the workers. They have a demerit point system where if you take too long to move objects, or even take too long of a bathroom break, you can earn demerit points, and too many of those will get you fired. No questions asked. Because as I mentioned, Amazon is optimized for a single task at the end of the day. And that is shoveling unlimited amounts of money into the bottomless maw of Jeff Bezos. And on top of that, while Amazon does run itself like a very efficient planned economy on the inside, its outside still functions as a capitalist market. You know, the Amazon store still has prices on it. So how are you gonna distribute resources if not based through the fact that all these items have different costs associated with it? And I do think that Amazon's optimization features can be co-opted and used for good purposes. Can you imagine if we had that hyper-efficient, optimizing thinking and uh, infrastructure, but it was designed to optimize workers' rights, environmental sustainability, and on top of that, also distributed objects not based on their prices, but maybe something more akin to a library. Libraries distribute items not based on a market economy, and they seem to do pretty well at it. So why not have something like that? As well, if we were to seize this system of production for ourselves, we can tweak it to optimize for anything we want. And most importantly, we can open it to democratic control instead of Jeff Bezos control. It's another way that we would make our economy more democratic. There's also the huge issue of all of that data collected. It's basically impossible at the end of the day on a long enough time span to really anonymize data. And there are serious privacy issues on how to deal with the problem of data. And I don't have a solution in this video. I'm not a data expert. Uh, I would be really interested to find out if there are some good answers, but at this moment, I don't think anyone's got one that anyone's like 100% satisfied with. And so that's something that we're gonna have to think about. That's a problem we have yet to solve. But I do think that we can disentangle Amazon's optimization systems from its capitalist drive. And I think we must do that. If you wanna learn more, I recommend that you read The People's Republic of Walmart, which this video is based on, and if you want to watch uh, my video on how Walmart is the master of the planned economy, you can go and watch that. Oh, and another thing.